Hey friends, I am so happy that you are here with me today. And we are going to talk about something that's pretty much near and dear to my heart. And that is not necessarily functional medicine, but a little bit of a deeper dive into functional medicine related to your gut health and how that affects mental health. So you all know from my book, You, Me, and Anxiety, how important mental health is to me and how I want to decrease the stigma around it and increase awareness and also help people navigate it and learn different tools and ways that they can do that. And so what we eat has a huge impact on our daily lives. It has a huge impact on how we think, how we feel, how we behave and what we do with, in terms of our habits and everything else. So I'm really happy to bring this guest to you today and dive into this and ultimately end our conversation with some stress resiliency tips. So we're going to talk about gut health, mental health, and stress and some tips so that we can become resilient through all of these stressful moments and using diet as a way to help us do that. So without further ado, I am going to bring on Lane Van Lees out to the Robin Graham show. Hello. Hi, how are you today? I'm good. It's so good to be here. So thank you for having me. Yes. Awesome. I'm thrilled to have you. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I am really happy that we get the opportunity to dive into it today. I think as entrepreneurs, as moms, we so oftentimes lose sight of our health and the things that we can do to make our life better, less stressful, and and then to help our families too. So these are going to be such incredible tips to not only keep ourselves healthy and navigate stress, navigate anxiety associated all of our daily activities and entrepreneurship and parenthood, but also help us bring that information back to our families as well. So will you just please tell the listeners a little bit about you and your background and how you became an expert on in functional medicine? Yeah, so I'm Lane, and I have a background as a nurse practitioner. I've actually been in the healthcare field for over 12 years and worked as a nurse practitioner for the past three and some change. And several years ago, I started learning functional medicine and have since completely made the transition to just functional medicine, which is all about getting to the root cause of our symptoms and our illnesses. And this is different from the traditional medical model, which largely focuses on diagnosing and treating, usually with pharmaceuticals. And yes, there is an element of lifestyle counseling provided sometimes, but it's definitely not implemented nearly enough. And ultimately that approach does not address the underlying root causes in most cases. And so that is the model I learned in nurse practitioner school and practiced for many years. But then I personally struggled with some health stuff a few years ago, which we can definitely talk more about. And I just knew that for me, putting a prescription over my symptoms was not the answer that aligned with me. And I'm not bashing anyone that has done that. It just wasn't for me. And we have a multitude of tools when it comes to managing anxiety. And that was one of them, but not one that I wanted to call upon for me personally. And so I realized there was another school of thought that focuses on supporting the body more naturally in order to reestablish balance. And so now I help women in a functional medicine role do the same with their bodies and their health. So a lot of women who are struggling with low energy, no matter how much you sleep or how much coffee you're drinking, you feel burnt out, overwhelmed. You might struggle with mental fog, not being able to like maintain your goal weight, even though you feel like you're doing all the right things, inflammation and skin, your joints, you have joint pain or acne and even digestion issues too. So all of these are symptoms and these are things that your body is trying to tell you that something is off. And with functional medicine, we can dig deeper to find out what that message is, what is off balance, and therefore, how can we best address these things using a scientific, but a more natural approach. And so I focus highly on gut health and hormone health, because I feel these things are very critical to our overall health, including our mental state. 100%. And you said something, and I have a pharmacy background. So I am never, ever going to say, do not take medicines because I think there is a time and a place where 
sometimes there just is no other option. And that's why we have them. It, they do save lives. They do help people feel better, get better, navigate things. But you're right when oftentimes we go to a general practitioner and okay, here, you feel this, so here's a pill. And so it's a Band-Aid. It's covering up the symptoms. We're masking the symptoms, but we're not getting to the root of the problem. And because I am a strategic thinker and I'm extremely curious, I like to dig deep and I like to get to the root of the problem and not just cover up whatever is at the surface. So I love that we're going to have this conversation today. Let's talk a little bit about, because you mentioned both gut health and hormone health. And as women, my audience is primarily women. And I think it's important for men to recognize hormone health as well, because it helps with relationships and keeping our relationships stable when they understand what a woman's body is going through as we age. But let's start with gut health and let's talk a little bit about what we put into our bodies that maybe we shouldn't be putting into our bodies that can affect our mental health or what we should be putting into our bodies to prevent mental health challenges. Definitely. So gut health is it encompasses what we call the enteric nervous system. So our gut is actually the home to a large portion of our nervous system. And we also have this vagus nerve that runs from our gut to our brain. And this is how our body communicates to our brain, whether our world is safe or not, whether we're in fight or flight or rest and digest. And this nerve gets regulated largely by our microbiome, which is where the natural bacteria and viruses and all the bugs are in our gut. And when that balance of the microbiome is off, then the communication to our brain gets skewed via that vagus nerve. And then we can get more inflammation in the gut and this contributes to inflammation elsewhere. And when we are stressed and it's like a revolving door. So when you're stressed, your gut health is going to suffer. And that's because your body does not prioritize the gut as an organ system when it's in fight or flight mode or under extreme stress it's going to prioritize other functions. And it does that because it's smart. It's not because it's messed up or something's gone wrong. That's for survival purposes. And so the gut suffers, our digestion is going to come off. Our stomach acid is going to suffer as well. So we're not going to process food as well. We're not going to absorb nutrients. And all of this leads to downstream issues that can result in hormonal imbalances because the nutrients that are needed for hormones are not coming onto our, or on board. Uh, it can lead to inflammation and just a whole host of other things. And so I really, when it comes to diet, that it has an integral role in our gut health and therefore our mental health. So if you're struggling with mental health issues with whether it's anxiety, depression, or brain fog, or just feeling like sometimes you're just not motivated or you can't concentrate, or you're just so exhausted and can't think straight, then really consider starting with diet and nutrition. I prefer to call it nutrition because it's not a diet that we're on. It's what are we bringing on, on board to nourish our bodies? And so some things that you can avoid that are leading causes of inflammation. One of them is gluten, and this can be the case, even if you're not like a celiac person, you can have a gluten sensitivity. And the reason behind that is gluten can cause inflammation to the gut lining, which can lead to inflammation elsewhere, like in the brain. So that's when we might see brain fog or decreased concentration and some other mental health stuff. And the reason this happens is we have a mucosal lining inside our gut barrier. And over time, we can have wear and tear on that lining from inflammatory products that we're eating and also the byproducts of bacteria. So it can wear on that gut lining. And then if that becomes too thin, things that were supposed to stay in the gut can actually cross over into the systemic body. And that creates an immune response because the immune system sees it as a foreign invader and it's going to attack again, because the body is smart. It's not that it's doing anything wrong. It's seeing something that shouldn't be there and it's going to act appropriately. And we can see that these inflammatory byproducts target certain tissues sometimes like our joints causing pain or our skin causing acne or our brain causing that brain fog. Some other things you can avoid, especially if you're trying to decrease that inflammation and improve your gut health are corn and soy products, because these are highly inflammatory. They're often sprayed very heavily with pesticides too. And they can also cause a cross reaction with gluten sometimes 
And it's not to say that you can never eat these things again, but it's important to maybe remove them for a period of time, focus on healing your gut and then reintroducing later. Some other things are inflammatory oils like canola and vegetable oils. I would avoid those artificial colors and sweeteners. Try to stay away from those as much as possible. Of course, it's okay to have a treat every now and then, but just be mindful of what your, the majority of your intake is that 90% of intake versus maybe the 10% here and there preservatives. And then things like refined carbs. So like our breads, pastas, pastries, sugary foods can be very inflammatory too. They can cause a glucose spike, an insulin spike, and that has a role in inflammation and mental health too. Uh, also try to avoid alcohol because it can mess with your neurotransmitters. Bean is a big one too, because some people are just intolerant to caffeine. They don't metabolize it as quickly as others, and that can play a role. So those are some of the big things to remove. So I'm gluten-free and I'm gluten-free because I was experiencing that brain fog. I was experiencing a lot of stomach issues. And so I went gluten-free and it did make a huge difference in my life. It also helped decrease inflammation. And I witnessed this in my mom as well. And so I'm a strong supporter of experiencing gluten-free living. Now I have one question for you. And I know the answer to this because I've been through all this before, but how do you suggest people start? Do you suggest they eliminate all of these things and then gradually bring them back in? Or do you suggest they eliminate one thing at a time and see if they actually experience feeling better? I would say it depends. It depends on the person and it depends on how significant your symptoms are. So if you are someone who has a lot of gut symptoms and you don't know what you're reacting to, you're reacting to something, it's probably best to do a more comprehensive elimination diet up front. That way you're getting that rapid relief from removing the inflammatory triggers. But if you're someone who just has maybe some other symptoms, you struggle with some mental health imbalance, but the GI system itself seems okay, then maybe just start with what's attainable for you. So, cause this is a lot to remove all of those things at once. It's not easy. It takes throwing out everything in your pantry sometimes, and that's just not always a feasible option. And so I would say if you, if you're not someone who can just do everything at once, which most people aren't then just start with one thing. And I would say, start with gluten if you can. Again, that one's tricky because there's a lot of hidden gluten and there's a lot of cross reactivity. So there's the consideration, should you remove all grains as well, but also just reduce it. Even if you can't remove it fully, reduce these things, reduce that sugar load, reduce the alcohol intake. And I think once you do that, you'll start feeling so much better and you'll see that you do have that ability to continue feeling better if you continue to tweak your nutrition. So we had, I know, oh, can't think of her last name all of a sudden, but she wrote euphoric alcohol free. And she was on the show not long ago. And she talked about her journey with going alcohol free and the difference it made in her life. And so I have a question for you. When you say reducing alcohol, what do you consider safe? What do you consider like for someone who maybe does have anxiety, someone who maybe is experiencing that brain fog, or maybe they're going to eliminate gluten. What do you recommend as far as that? Do you recommend zero alcohol? Do you recommend one or two glasses a week? What do you, what is your viewpoint on alcohol consumption? So I would say, again, it depends on like where you're starting. If you're someone who drinks multiple drinks a day, cut it back to one drink a day. If you're someone who drinks one drink a day, maybe cut it down to five days a week or three days a week. Cause in general, like one glass of wine or something is not going to be the ultimate, like t- the most terrible thing you can do for your health. But it does, I will say it does depend on the timing too, because if you're drinking too late in the evening, you can really have your sleep affected by that. That can cause like GABA glutamate imbalance. So you're getting woken up at 2 a.m. with the hot flashes and feeling thirsty and things like that. And anxiety sometimes sets in that period. And so that's glutamate and that's because of the alcohol. And if that's the case and you're not sleeping, I would say, drink earlier in the day. If you have to, I don't mean like noon or anything, unless it's the weekend maybe, but there, I heard this thing recently, like happy hour was invented to be around 5 PM for a reason. And that's because of the amount of time it takes to metabolize alcohol. So when we're drinking a glass of wine at eight, nine, 10 o'clock, and then trying to go to bed right after it helps sometimes to fall asleep right away. But if you're not staying asleep, 
that's an issue. And then you're not going to be getting a full night's rest. And then your next day is going to be thrown off too. From a nutrition standpoint, you're going to have more cravings. You're not going to focus on some of the more nutritious things and it's going to mess with your anxiety too. So I would say probably one drink a night is fine for most people. It really just depends on what's going on and what your goals are and what's reasonably attainable for you. Okay. I love that. And then you also mentioned caffeine and everybody knows I love my coffee. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love it way too much, but so I want to hear your perspective on coffee as well. And don't be afraid to tell, to offend me that I drink too much (laughs) because I know I drink too much. (laughs) So I love coffee as well, but it, coffee did not love me back. I used to drink it without a problem. And then one day, several years ago, and this is when all of my anxiety started surfacing and I realized that caffeine made it so much worse. It gave me like this chest tightness. I would have palpitations. I would feel like lightheaded and just nervous. And so I realized the coffee, the caffeine in the coffee was just too much for me to handle. And it also goes back to like, is your body able to metabolize that caffeine? And so I personally love matcha and green teas because they have that little bit of caffeine, but it's more of a steady state release. It doesn't give you that peak and crash. And it also contains a component called L-theanine, which is a really calming component that can help. It can still help you focus, but not with the jitters or anything like that. So I personally would opt for for a different caffeine source, but if people tolerate coffee fine, then that's great. But if you're someone who struggles with anxiety and think caffeine might be a trigger for you, then consider making the swap, especially if you need a little caffeine to, to make it through the day. And I know weaning off of coffee or any type of caffeine can be pretty brutal. Uh, Another thing with coffee too, though, is it is very heavily sprayed with pesticides. And so you really want organic coffee. Yeah. That's one of the big things with, you want to, you don't want to just be in drinking a cup of pesticides if you can help it. Yeah. yeah. And I can do help. get organic coffee and there are a lot of really good organic coffee brands out there. And yes. okay. And you're talking about like the anxiety and the caffeine. What about decaf coffee? As long as it's organic. So decaf might be okay. And if you just love coffee, love the taste, because I get it. Decaf can be better. I still think that there are better drink options with better health benefits, because I know decaf coffee is like very highly processed for them, like removing the caffeine and everything. Mm -hmm. And coffee in general can be contaminated with mold. It gets moldy pretty quickly, even though you can't necessarily see it, but they found like a lot of coffees to be contaminated. If the decaf is something that you tolerate better, that's your thing then go for it. (laughs) But for those who are interested in like maybe what a healthier swap would be, I would highly recommend going for a green tea or a matcha tea, but those have to be from a good brand too and organic too, because those can also have pesticides and heavy metals. So you just have to be careful with your sourcing. Yeah. And there are some really good matcha tea, organic matcha teas out there on the market. I know that's usually my afternoon treat. Like I'll have coffee in the morning, but then in the afternoon it's matcha tea. And if you have just a little bit of frothed oat milk to it, it's like a little latte. It's so good. (laughs) Okay. So let's talk a little bit about corn products and the brain. I knew this whole GMO thing with corn. Plus also you have pesticides and stuff like that because farmers are so frequently having to use them nowadays. What about organic corn products or is it just corn in general that we should avoid? So organic corn, especially I think it's like sweet white corn is much better than the standard because of the GMO and the pesticides and everything. So in general, corn's not the enemy. It's the processing and everything that goes on. But if you are someone who is gluten sensitive or gluten intolerant, sometimes you can cross react with corn. And so it may be something to remove at least temporarily while we do some gut healing, refocus on rebuilding that mucosal lining and decreasing inflammation in the gut. So corn can be okay for sure. I do think there's also some better swaps as far as corn chips or tortillas or something like that. So a large part of it does have to do with the spraying, the pesticides and all of that. And yeah. I think so the what do you thing- recommend for an alternative to corn products like corn chips or tortillas? So there's a brand called Siete. It's S-I-E-T-E, S-I-E-T-E, so Siete. Okay. And they do completely grain-free products. So they have chips and 
tortillas. And that, they probably have some other things too, but I know those are two of the good ones. And they don't have soy in them either. So let's talk about, this is fascinating to me. I love all this. <laughs> Because I have been avoiding soy for years and years, but that was because of the increased risk with breast cancer. I want to hear your thoughts on that as well. So soy, a lot of it, a lot of it really does come back to the way soy is grown and processed. So it, how are they sprayed? How are they handled? How are they processed? That is what really leads a lot of the inflammation. The soy products that can be much better for you are like fermented soy. It has to be organic though. I would not eat unorganic. So tempeh is a fermented soy product. And that's what a lot of like vegans and vegetarians might use in place of meat. And it's a decent protein source. And then tofu as well. It is more processed, but it can have its benefits as far as the the estrogenic component. So it's really dependent on the person and how they metabolize it. And there's some testing we can do. I actually like love the Dutch test. It's a comprehensive hormone test that looks uses dried urine and it can show you your estrogen metabolism pathways. And I think that's one area we could look at to see which which pathway you favor and which could be like potentially more carcinogenic in the long run, because some people do really well with soy products and that actually can be a protective mechanism for them, but then others, it may put them at higher risk for cancers. Yeah. It's also fascinating. Okay. So obviously artificial colors, artificial sweeteners, preservatives, those are things we should avoid. And it's really amazing when you look at things in the grocery store and what they contain. There are so many things that you think are healthy that have preservatives or artificial sweeteners or artificial colors. There's so many little things hidden in labels. It's almost scary. And when you're trying to eat healthy and trying to purchase healthy things for your families, it's very challenging. Like it, it takes a lot of time to read the labels and understand what's out there. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about carbs because like, I know there's like all the diets that eliminate carbs completely, but when we were growing up, we had, what was it? The food pyramid. And they always taught us like you had your few fruits, vegetables, meats, grains, and complex carbohydrates. So tell us a little bit about that. Should we be eliminating all carbs? Should we look at things that maybe don't make us feel great, but I'm guessing that it's hard to identify that. So I would never say to avoid all carbs. I don't think that that's a sustainable lifestyle practice. And I think you're also missing out on a lot of micronutrients if you're avoiding fruit and things like that too. So I wouldn't demonize carbs as a group, but it's the processed carbs that we want to really be mindful about. And so I'm all about eat as many fruits as you want, the sweet, the potatoes and stuff like that. There are times when you might want a lower carb diet. I wouldn't remove them all the way. Maybe some people thrive on like a keto diet, but it is very just dependent on their personal body and how they metabolize things and work through the heavy fats. But I just feel to have a really well-rounded, balanced nutritional diet, then you have to have some carb sources. And, you know, of course some vegetables have it too, but I would not avoid all carbs. I would be mindful of your carb intake of avoiding like the white breads or really like any, a lot of the processed breads in our grocery stores, even the wheat breads are very highly processed and essentially body sees them as the same as white breads, more whole grain with the seeds and it would be a better bread source. And then your traditional pastas and the bakery items, all of that your body sees as straight sugar. So you might as well just be eating sugar in place of those things. So I would avoid those, keep the fruits and the potatoes and all of that. I've also, I'm new to the concept of eating in a certain order. So if you are going to have a carb source, you can hack your body by eating vegetables or leafy greens first, followed by protein and then carbs at the end. That way it's not spiking your blood sugar as much. I love that. And that would be helpful for those of us who really love a sweet treat after dinner. Yeah, absolutely. I love that it's more about moderation and balance versus eliminating completely. Because I think when we do that, and I've never done that, but for people that I know have done that, it, they quickly go back to old habits. And so they've sacrificed and suffered basically not eating what they wanted to eat for months. And then they go right back to it. So any weight they lost actually comes right back on. So I love that you say that because I'm a firm believer in moderation and the same thing with alcohol. I think if you're drinking at, at appropriate levels that are healthy for you, then 
it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's a matter of being responsible and doing it in a healthy light. Okay. The other thing, I just want to get your opinion on this because I think a lot of, not necessarily your opinion, but your insight. A lot of people think going gluten-free means you're going to lose weight and you're immediately going to be healthy. And there is not a correlation between going gluten-free and losing weight. Like it's not a gluten-free diet to lose weight. It's a gluten-free lifestyle to promote gut health and brain health. Mm -hmm. So I think that you can lose weight when you remove gluten, not because of the gluten itself, but because of all the inflammatory products that you're not bringing on the things that gluten is in already. And I've even experienced that personally, when trying to remove a lot of gluten and grains, you're suddenly taking out a lot of the carb sources, even though you're still having some carbs. So you can see some weight loss, but that's not really the goal. It's to the goal with gluten removal is to decrease inflammation, to improve that gut health, which is going to improve your overall health. Yeah. 100%. Okay. So let's talk about what some of the foods that are really good for brain health. This is my favorite. So when it comes to food, I definitely think this is like the place to start any, in any, any type of healing journey. So food, whole foods as your main dietary intake is really the goal. You want to eat as little processed food as possible. So first thing is to focus on tons of colorful fruits and vegetables. You're going to get tons of antioxidants with this, and that's going to decrease inflammation. It's also going to give you all these micronutrients that your body needs to function to be able to detox and promote good hormone balance and all of that. And it also helps feed the good gut bacteria, which again, are critical in that regulation of our nervous system with how it communicates with our brain. And I love berries for this too. So like wild blueberries, they are one of the top fruits that are really high in antioxidants. So I shoot for about five servings of fruits and vegetables a day and eat the rainbow. Try to have several different colors on your plate. And then the next one I would say is healthy fats. So Fat was demonized over the past several decades is not demonized quite so much anymore, but we need fats for every cell in our body to have good integrity. And that includes our brain and therefore our brain health and brain function. So salmon is one of my favorites. It is best if it's wild caught because that's just the more natural form of fish. But if farmed is all that you have access to, then it's still better than nothing. I also love to incorporate different nuts and seeds like walnuts and chia seeds. So shoot for three to five servings of healthy fats per day. You can also do some extra virgin olive oil, like to drizzle that on so many different things, lunch and dinner, and then avocados. And then another really important thing when it comes to mental health is protein. And this is important because of the amino acid content. So bringing those amino acids on board is also going to help regulate our nervous system, it is going to help our neurotransmitters work more properly. And so don't skip on the protein. And I really try to eat at least 30 grams of protein for each meal, especially breakfast, because that's, what's going to set you up for a better day. As far as your energy levels, your concentration, mental clarity. And it's also going to help with some of those cravings later in the day. When you would go for the sugary stuff, you might find that when you have a higher protein diet, you don't think about those things as much. So what are your favorite sources of protein? Definitely salmon is the top one. I'm a big chicken thigh fan, even though I don't like cooking them because it takes so much effort, but it is really good. I, I would say just a variety, eat a variety of different meats. So some red meat, not every day, but maybe once or twice a week. And then chicken's really good. It's actually better to have the bone and skin on chicken because it helps keep in all the nutrients more. It's actually more flavor, but it is a little bit more work. So just do what you can. And I love a good protein powder too, just to supplement because it's really hard to get oh, 30 grams of protein in every meal without a little bit of a supplement. And so one of my favorite protein powders is called New Zest. It's N-U-Z-E-S-T. And they're really clean. They're minimal ingredients and they test multiple times for like heavy metals and stuff like that too. Oh, that's good to know. Cause it's hard. We're inundated with so many products on the market that you don't know what to buy. I know it is a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's talk about, I could talk about diet and stuff all day long, but <laughs> let's talk about stress resiliency tips. Yes. We know that being an entrepreneur is very demanding. We end up wearing like tons of different hats, especially in the beginning. And it can take a really big toll. It can cause overwhelm pretty quickly. So I really want to and stress the importance of 
being able to handle this stress because the stress doesn't really go away. It's your response to stress. And so how can we be better equipped to handle these stressors as they inevitably come? And so I always want to prioritize self-care. Like it sounds so cliche, but really like downtime, take some time away from the screens is something that I'm having to like work on as well, because you think you have to just work, work and go, and then you end up way more stressed than you like maybe should have been or needed to be. So reflect back on on everything that you're going through and prioritize your health over certain other things. Sometimes you take the bath, take the five minutes of deep breathing, because when you recharge yourself in that way, it's going to set you up for more success in your business. It's going to help you help your clients more because you have taken that time to recover and then be able to show up how you want to. And definitely focus on nutrition, like getting those adequate nutrients, like magnesium is really important for me because magnesium helps regulate our nervous system and so many other cellular functions. Sometimes I'll supplement with magnesium. That's actually one of my go-to supplements. The glycinate and three and eight form are my favorites because they cross the blood brain barrier and B vitamins are also really important. So going off on a tangent about supplements real, real quick, because B vitamins are needed for energy production and also nervous system function. So a lot of this stuff you can get from food, but sometimes we need a little extra boost to fill in the gaps. So nutrition, nutrients are definitely really important. Also hydration, because our cells need water to function and energy is made in these cells. So drinking clean filtered water first thing in the morning is going to help with your digestion. It's going to help with your stress hormone response. And it's always the first thing I try to do. And then as far as our nervous system goes, we can actually hack our nervous system ourselves. And our parasympathetic nervous system is where we rest and digest. And that's what we want to be our dominant nervous system. So ways you can activate that are taking those deep cleansing breaths, slow inhale, slow exhale, and then getting outside, getting that fresh air, being in nature is also going to help lower stress hormones and it's beneficial to our immune system. So it's just so, so many different benefits with that. And then I tried to really focus on movement with a little bit of exercise every day, because that's going to give you those endorphins. That's going to help with focus and energy. Even if it's as simple as a 15 minute walk or like 15 minutes of yoga, it's going to make a big difference in how you feel. And then one of the other things too, is especially if you do have a caffeine intolerance where you feel like the coffee or anything makes you more anxious, make the swap to something like green tea or matcha especially if you have those symptoms, because you'll get that little bit of caffeine to kind of give you that motivation and energy, but not necessarily the spike and crash. So you're going to be focused longer. And because of that L-theanine in it, it's going to help with a calming effect too. So it's just a really good option for those who need a little bit of caffeine to, to be productive, but just don't tolerate the coffee. And with anything that you are doing, especially when you're making big changes or you have a lot of things that you want to do is just start with one thing. So if you feel like all of this is too much and you're not doing any of these things, but you want to, but you don't know where to begin, just pick one that resonates with you the most, incorporate that and just be consistent with that. Don't feel like you have to do everything at once because that doesn't really set anyone up for success. If you feel like you have to take on everything. So pick one, set these short attainable goals because that's what's going to propel you forward and wanting to reach more goals and have that snowball effect. And then before you know it, you'll be able to look back at how far you've come. You had two things to recommend to the listeners to try today to keep their mind healthy and their body healthy. What would those two things, based on what we've talked about today, what would those two suggestions be? It would start with nutrition. So where can you improve your nutrition, getting the whole foods, reducing processed foods for sure, eating the rainbow and all of that. And then two is helping regulate your nervous system. So taking five minutes once or twice a day, just to focus on your breathing, recentering yourself, because that's going to give you so much more clarity and be able to go on much more strong and resilient to, to be able to do your work better. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing to me how integral the diet is to our overall physical and mental health. So listeners, if you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, please share it with your friends and family who may be struggling with mental health challenges or just 
a lot of stress or a lack of energy, not sleeping, some of these things may help them. So please spread the word by all means. And also please leave a rating and review because that is what helps us to grow. If you are struggling with anxiety, you can also download my free ebook, Developing Healthy Habits for a Healthy Mind. And that is available at therobingraham.com forward slash resources. And I do encourage you to download that. It is really like a free look into the journal that accompanied you, me and anxiety. So that may help you and hopefully will help you, but also just give you a kickstart because then you can start journaling what you're eating and what the effects are on your body and then take into account some of the, th these things that Lane suggested. Lane, where can the listeners find you, learn more from you, connect with you, and maybe even hire you? Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram. It, my handle is Lane underscore Van Lease House. That's L A Y N E underscore V A N L I E S H O U T. So I'm on Instagram and TikTok actually. And on my website, there's actually a free guide that you can go download right now that talks all about some things with gut health and how you can start improving that on your within your daily habits. And so my website is lvwellnessconsulting.com. And at the top right corner, you'll see free guide. You can just download that for free. Awesome. And I will put the link to all of that in the show notes. So listeners, all you have to do is click over to the show notes and everything will be right there for you to click through, to be able to download any of those guides or connect with Lane on Instagram or TikTok. So with that, guys, we are closing out for today, but we'll be back again next week for another incredible episode. Thanks for being here, Lane. Thank you so much for having me.